Well, it's interesting that you pointed out about Willie Lynch and this meritorious man you mentioned. There's a mood growing in this country. I don't know if you're aware of it. I know you travel all over the country, but there's a mood in this country where a lot of black folks are starting to say, I'm tired. We are tired of the same old, same old. We mm. hear the rhetoric of integration. We hear the terms busing. We don't have any economic wealth or anything to show for it. Is there an organization or are, are, is there a movement that you are aware of that's coming afoot where blacks can start expressing this frustration and channeling it towards something positive? Yes. Uh, I think the basis would be uh, the movement that I've been pushing out for a number of years. That's called the Harvest Institute, coming out of our black, only black think tank. Also, my Powernomics movement across the country. I think in terms is that from the the term in the Bible, the harvest is plentiful. That's but right. But the labor is a few. That's right. <laughs> that the black, black it's harvest time for black folk in this country. We've we've been the laboring class now for 460 years. It's time for us to come to the table to the banquet. Uh, I think that's the largest movement in the country and in terms of identification. How big is this organization? I think in terms of identification and support right now, we are probably bigger than the Urban League, the NAACP, the Rainbow Coalition, and the Muslims put together. As a matter of fact, I don't think there are very many speakers in the United States that pull bigger crowds than I do mm -hmm. in the United States. And, 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 and these blacks are coming out, not because I had that much to say, but, they, but they're tired. They're tired of being losers, Paul. They want to say, tell us, give us a new direction. Give us some new concepts. Give, give us some new, new justifications for going in new, new directions. Give us some new paradigms, the way we should see things, the way we should behave, the way we should operate in a race-based society. And that's what we try to do. So now we're, we're spreading and we're moving very quickly in this country. And I can guarantee you very shortly, most blacks in this country will have no interest in integration. They can have no interest in civil rights. They can have no interest in voter registration. Because all those things, we're not, we're not playing the win in those areas. Equal, e, uh, integration, civil rights, and, and, uh, and voter rights cannot solve the problem. Neither one of them can restore or redistribute the wealth and resources into black folks' hands. What do you say to people who describe that notion as separation, as if separation is some kind of disease? What do you, how do you respond to them if they say, oh yeah, it sound, you sound very intelligent, but you want us to separate? <clears throat> no, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not asking you to separate. Uh, first of all, there's nothing wrong with separation. See, the issue back in the integration was not separation. It was, it was desegregation, which means stop the government from using its resources to hurt black folk. We never were interested in integration. That's the first thing. Secondly, is that they never apply that term to any other group. Why is it they, why is it they never apply that term to, to the Asians and the Jewish communities and the Hispanic communities? And, and I, I, all of this country, I got, I got Germantown, Frenchtown, Greek towns, little Italy, little Havanas, little Cubas, uh, little Japans. I mean, is there to, something wrong with little Africa? Yeah, see, well, see, that's what I'm saying. Why, why is it? See, see, I know what it is. See, because everybody understands that the minute you start allowing people to group, you got the basis of foundation for getting power and wealth. So what they want to do as much as possible is keep black folks segregated, keep I mean, se se disintegrated through the integration process. But more importantly than that, I had a, bl I had a white fellow ask me back during, during integration once in the South. I was speaking and when I was with the governor's office there and over education. And this guy came up to me, he said, Dr. Anzi, I heard you talking. He said, but one thing concerns me. He says, it's frustrating to me. I don't understand it. I said, what's the matter? He says, now I keep, he said, explain this to me. He said, on one hand, you got Martin Luther King running around the country saying he wants integration. He wants to be with whites all the time. And I said, you got, you, on the other hand, you got Malcolm X over here saying that he wants segregation and separation. He wants to be with all blacks. He said, you all are confused. I said, what do you want? Do you all want, which end of the stick do you want? Do you want the left hand of the stick? Do you want the right hand of the stick? I said, I don't want either end of the stick. I don't want either end of the stick. I said, I want my people to have the same rights and prerogatives and privileges as everyone else. You don't ask anybody else. You don't ask Jews or uh, uh, Asians or Hispanics which end of the stick they want. Then why ask black folk that? I said, because in this country, Paul, the bottom line is this. In this country, the issue is not segregation on the right. It's not integration on the left. It's neither one of those two. Contra and I want my civil rights organization to hear me clearly this morning. Read my lips over your TV program. It has nothing in the world to do with integration or segregation. It has to do with aggregation, concentration of your wealth and power and resources to improve the life of your people. Why are the, some civil rights leaders so afraid to speak on national television or before audiences about aggregating economic wealth? Because they're scared the white society will cut off their money because they know that black folk only have one half of one percent of the wealth. 
that they got a potential then of, of keeping wealth in their community. As an example, black folk right now have an annual disposable income, Paul, of approximately $500 billion annually. That makes black folk about the ninth richest nation on earth. Now, now what black folk are doing, they're displacing through, through what we call flight of capital. They spend 95% of that money outside their own communities. They spend another 3% inside their community in, in non-black hands, non-black businesses. Black people only keep 2% out of this $500 billion. That means they're trying to live off and survive off of something like about seven or eight billion dollars a year. Seven or eight billion out of 500 billion. Now, if they listen to what I'm saying, and they kept all that $500 billion in their, in their own community, where they historically have been making off only four or five billion, look at that, that means that black folk will have exposure to more wealth in one year, listen to Claude Anson, they would otherwise take them 60 Under years. Under what you would call in your economic terms, the multiplier effect. That's right. Keep the money in your own community. In other words, it's, your money is supposed to bounce 8 to 12 times before it leaves your community. Because that's what it happens in the white community. In the white society, white society keeps, makes the money bounce and pass through other white hands 8 to 12 times before it leaves. Hispanics, money passes 6 to 7 times through their hands before it leaves a Hispanic hand. Jews' money bounced 18 times before it leaves their hand. Black money does not bounce one time. Now, so are you saying we're like a sieve? That you're like a sieve. You're just, you're just hemorrhaging to death. So if, if I can get black folks to understand the importance of keeping the money in their community and making sure that it bounces in other black hands before it leaves, that's a threat to the white community. Because what they're saying now is, oh, God, you know, right now any white person can make it. Why would white people be afraid of them. I mean, why would black leaders be afraid that white people would get mad at them for that concept? Because, 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 because they're, so, they're, more, they're, more, they're more attracted to being accepted by the white society than solving the problems of their own people. So they want white folks to pat them on the head That's right. rather than uh, put some money in their pocket. That's right. And so you know, you know who said it best? There's, there's, a white, there's a white politician, not a white, white politician, but a white political science professor at Harvard University named Andrew Hacker. He wrote a book called Two Worlds Separate and Unequal. Mm -hmm. And what he says, he said he doesn't understand, even as a white person, why black folk are so concerned about what white folks think about them, that, that, that blacks are almost paralyzed. They're afraid to make decisions that will enhance the quality of life for their own people because they're afraid that white folks won't like it. Mm -hmm. Rather than simply saying that they don't owe white folks any explanation as to what they're going to do to try to improve the conditions of their own people. That sounds uh, criminal. And in a few minutes, that we have remaining. I'd like to get a kind of quick response to about four or five questions that I want to ask you to sort of get on the record. Crime in the black community. What is your general thesis about a solution and a plan and a, how we should address that issue? <laughs> very simply, crime, com crime comes from a very simple problem. You steal them because you, you have, you see, there are only three things that a person can do in life to earn a living. Three things, Paul. You either work on welfare or you steal. Now, if you've been denied the opportunities and the tools to, to, to work and acquire wealth this way, then you go on welfare. Somebody kicks you off of welfare, you go down to the next level, you steal. And right now, it, with, with the little combination of welfare money and the illicit activities in the black community, that's where most of the money is coming from. You, as a matter of fact, if I were to stop the drug dealing in Washington, D.C., in the black community, where I got about 26,000 young black men selling drugs around Washington, D.C., if I were to, to cut out the drug selling and the crime around Washington, do you know the unemployment rate in the black community go up by 4%? Hmm. You have, what option? You give them some options. They quit stealing. If you give, you give them the same amount of wealth. And what options do you say they should give them? We started building out. We started make black folk job producers rather than job seekers. Take them, keep the wealth in their community. Build their own industries. Increase their own tax base. Give them, give them the incentives to improve the quality of their schools that relate to them being being people who are going to be of worse. You know, in other words, improve the schools so that the schools will focus on economics rather than producing athletes and entertainers who are disenchanted with the black community and will alienate themselves in the black communities. Uh, what, you know, this is probably the one area that we could probably have a whole nother one hour show. And that's an area that you're probably most equipped in. And uh, we education. didn't get in education. Yeah. Uh, see, very briefly. See, <laughs> well, the, see, the education system right now is dysfunctional in the black community. Going back to what I told you about 1868, yes. the, the, for the, through, the through the Freedmen's Bureau, the, the school systems in America were set up for black folk to train, a, to produce semi-educated black folk who will work as a labor class for whites. It's never been stopped. See, I don't know why blacks keep operating the schools under a context and a premise that was set up over 150 years ago. You cannot do anything with the black schools until you find out where you want to go as a race of people. If we want to go to the moon tomorrow, then and we decide that. Now we know how to change our school system. We go back into the school system and say, we want to go to the moon. Now schools, you rewrite your curriculum so that you can produce more black astronauts, more black physicists, more black chemists. 
and more of it so that we can go into outer space and live there. Now you rewrite your curriculum based on where black folk want to go. Black folks don't have a national plan, not the least of all an economic plan. So if you don't have a plan, your schools can't produce what you want. In the, in the book that you're coming out with called Powernomics, do you have an economic plan? Yeah, it? the power, power economics is an economic plan in and of itself. So if we want to get the, the elements of the outline, so in the book that's behind you, to your left there, Black Labor, White Wealth, briefly for within the next 30 seconds, can you tell our viewers what is the general thesis of that book and why they should read it? That book does what, what no other book has done in history. It summarizes the, what, what, what other people put into a thousand books about black folk. It tells you exactly how, how we got into our dilemma and how the wealth has been maldistributed and what the major problems are in this society why we can't get out of it. Then at the end of the book, it recommends a general broad category of all the solutions we need to be looking at very quickly and the timetable we're operating, operating under. The new book, Powernomics, will, take, will give you all the solutions. And the other book you got in your hand called Dirty Little Secrets, I'm giving you all the little known facts in history about what little known facts in history about what has happened to black folk that no that everybody wants to keep hidden. This it's is called the dirty little time. secrets about black history, black heroes, and other troublemakers. That's the book. That is a powerful little book in telling you, giving you some indication of how why you can't solve the race problems in America. I was reading this book and I wanted to know why did you draw a handkerchief on the head of our Supreme Court justice? <laughs> Don't you think that's kind of irreverent to do? You mean you mean Clarence Thomas? Yes, sir. Well, I didn't I didn't I didn't really draw it on there, even though it's on there. It's, it, that means that's an Aunt Jemima head rag on his head. That was that was put on there by Merge magazine. They gave me authorization to to reprint it as one of the dirty little secrets. He also, Clarence Thomas shows up twice in that book. He shows up again as a lawn jockey, um, where he's standing out you know, with the thumb up like this, uh, holding, a, hold, holding a lantern for white society, carrying their water for him. How does one get in touch with you? Can you give a phone number that we will also run across the bottom of the screen as to how someone can call you? And if you could slowly tell your address and the name of your organization, <laughs> <laughs> you may not be used to the self-promotion here. Okay. But can you give your phone number, your address and the name of your organization very slowly okay. so that our viewers can write it down? Okay, let me give you my address first. Uh, it's the Harvest Institute. And the harvest is H-A-R-V-E-S-T. Harvest meaning bringing the fruits to bear to the table to, to eat, time to share. It's a Harvest Institute. You send the uh, send any inquiries and writing to 730, 730. That's 11th Street Northwest. That's in Washington, D.C. That's 20001. And what floor is it on? And that's on the fourth floor. And the telephone number there is 202. Four nine six one six two two. Do you have? Uh, you better repeat that phone number again. The telephone number, and we, we and, you know, please call us. Particularly, even if you could, and especially if you could plan on making some donations, because we are a tax exempt nonprofit institute, and anything you send to us, you can write it off your taxes. So what we're going to ask you to do is send us any kind of a contribution, a donation that otherwise you'd be paying in taxes. Send us the money. We need it desperately to to move our our our, our agenda across this nation. Send it and, and call us at 202-496-1622. Uh, uh, That's the Harvest Institute. We need your, we need your support. Also, we have a, we'll send you uh, the list of uh, materials we put out. And if you join the Harvest Institute, you, there are a lot of benefits you can get, including a, a regular newsletter which addresses all these issues. Now, this is an interesting irony. You mean to tell me that if I send you a check for $100, I will be able to deduct it on my federal income tax as a tax write-off where you will teach me how black folks can uh, gather their money together. The government will allow me to get a that's, tax deduction. That's right. That's, right. <laughs> that's, that's, that's why the major, most of the major white corporations you know, say don't pay any money. And, the, and what most people understand is that in, we're the only national black think tank that's putting out, that's proactive, putting out prescriptions for black folks' empowerment. But on the other hand, we got, we're running against 1,200 white think tanks that have over 5,000 employees and a half a billion dollar budget. Black folk don't give us money because all your black entertainers and black athletes and your successful black business people, they're scared to give money to anything black. Have you, have you exposed your concepts to some of our black entertainers and athletes and, and uh, notoriety folk? Yes, and they're, and they're scared. They say, they're, they say things like, Dr. Anderson, what's the name of the organization? The Harvest Institute. They say, what is it for? I said, for black America. They say, who's going to operate it? We said, black folk. They said, who's going to benefit? We said black folks, oh, too black. Now, how does something get to be too black? I don't know. Nothing is too Jewish or too Indian or too Asian. But anytime you, it, again, I told you, anytime you start pulling black folk together, it becomes too bad. 
What about some of the rap stars and some of the musicians? You mean to tell me they say the same thing? Yeah, a lot of them do because even some of them, a lot of, a lot of personalities you see on TV every day say the same thing. Uh, they, they, what they're saying is that basically that, that they, don't, they do not want to offend whites by doing anything for black folk. What about politicians and politics? Farrakhan said at the Million Man March, that the day is over, just electing somebody just because of the color of their skin, that black America needs to develop a black agenda. What is your, do you call powernomics a black agenda? And if so, how do you apply it towards politicians in general and politics? Well, in effect, I wrote it to be a, a, a black agenda, but unfortunately it's, it, it's, it can be used. You know what, some of the biggest buyers and procurers of my books are Hispanics. Ironically, and they, what, what I'm writing in books, they turn around and using it against black folk. Uh, but Farrakhan was absolutely right. See, what black folk have failed to do in politics is never having gotten a contractual understanding between anybody that runs for office. I tell black folk never, never, never under any circumstance, vote for any person, black or white, until you got a commitment from them about what they're going to do for the black community. Not what they're going to do for in terms of hiring a secretary or a receptionist, a black secretary. No. Black, one black person did not put them in office. What are they going to do for them to deliver back to the black community? Politics is a process that decides who's going to get what benefits out of life and is based on quid pro quo. You are, you take care of me, I take care of you. I've never yet seen black folk demand from white or uh, black politicians uh, uh, accounting for what they're going to do to the black community. And once you put a person in office, even your current mayor in, in Oakland, you must ask from him, what are you going to do for black folk in this city? Then secondly, you must call him to task after one year time. So you come back before us, you tell us not anything social. You tell us, give, read us a list of all the money that you have redistributed into the black community. You name all the black millionaires and all the major black businesses that have started up since you've been in office. They can't do that. You pull them out of office. And does this auditing of elected officials, should this function apply to both black and white Blacks politics? Black and white. Black, well, Male have, and female. Male and female. You go after all of them. You go after them. You, you, you use such, you, there's devices you use like referendums, voter referendums, recalls, uh, and a whole bunch of new techniques that you can do to start pulling them out of office. Do not support anybody that would not support the black community, regardless of their color. Mm -hmm. Well, on behalf of the League of African American Voters, we hope that this show will inspire a real and sincere dialogue on the issue of race. And Dr. Claude Anderson, we want to thank you for exposing some of America's dirty little secrets. <laughs> well, thank you very much for inviting me, and I certainly hope that I that I can look forward to getting that uh, greater support from the religious sector in this city and the, and the blacks in this city. I do not want blacks to become an underclass. Blacks got about a year and a half in this city to either pull it together or they're going down for the count. And as we close, I want to ask you a quick yes or no question. Have you taken this message to President Clinton and John Hope Franklin's discussion on race? No. As a matter of fact, one of the things that they had made a commitment, Essence Magazine had asked me once to debate with President Clinton last July the 3rd in New Orleans, the race issue. And uh, I said yes, and he had said yes earlier, and he canceled out. Thank you on behalf of the League of African American Voters. Thank you.